Hi Ben here and welcome back to the workshop and today we're going to show you how we go about actually putting a knife handle on a full tang knife. So a few weeks ago, well actually I look back, it was actually beginning of March I think when we showed you how to prepare handle scales, so how to saw a piece of timber in half, how to prepare the surface and actually how to bond liners if you're going to use liners to a knife handle. So if you haven't seen that already, check that out first then come back here. But basically I use those handles that we prepared all those months ago but I've prepared another set, same material, so this is stabilised elm with those black fibre liners in there. So it'll be pretty much the same material. So that's the inside. So the next step is to go about actually drilling all the holes that we need to attach this handle to the knife blade itself. So on the knife blade itself you have normally two fixing points. This is uh, going to be for our loveless bolts or Corby bolts if you prefer to use Corbys. But two basically fixings that are going to hold the knife handle on. And then not, not always but I like to add what we call a thong tube or a lanyard hole at the end and that has a little brass sleeve that goes through the handle itself. Now these other holes are just weight reduction holes so we don't have to worry about those so if you if you're new to this game it is sometimes easy to drill the wrong size hole so sometimes you can actually cover those up with tape so you're not confused. But what I would say is it's best to do this handle prep stage before you actually grind or sharpen your knife blade. It's just going to make it a hell of a lot safer for you. If you have already prepared your knife and you've actually got a cutting edge on there, make sure you put some tape around there because you don't want to cut yourself while you're doing this stage. What I actually do, because I make a lot of the same knife, is I actually prepare a purely just a handle, handle blank. So it's got no blade on there and it allows me to orientate that onto the handle itself and then I can clamp it in place and I've got no fear of that blade getting caught. But in this instance what we'll do is we'll actually show you how to actually use the blade as your drilling guide. Now the other thing we want to think about is grain direction. So this has got a sort of nice sweeping grain to it. So I'm actually going to orientate the sort of handle itself so that the grain will sort of flow down the curve of the handle. You don't have to do that but I find that it just makes the whole thing look a lot nicer. And then you've got to carefully make sure that you line up those edges of the handle so that when it's finished we want the grain of the handle to look like it's all laid together and it's like that we've actually just sort of split the block in half and put our blade between the two halves of the scale. So we're trying to orientate the grain so it's all as it was when it was actually still growing as a tree. And then what I tend to f use, and I find that these work the best, are these quick uh, vice, vice grips. These ones with the flat ends are quite good, they pivot and they just sort of allow it to sort of move slightly to fit onto the handle scale itself and they want to be pretty tight. You want it to be a, quite an effort to squeeze that on there because you don't want anything to move. Now once I've got that blade sort of attached to that handle blank I know that pretty much things are set so make sure you spend a little bit of time orientating that grain and getting it correct. Now the next thing that we're going to use is our pillar drill setup. Now often when people come into the workshop they kind of laugh at the amount of pillar drills that I've got. Um, they say that it is possible to actually slacken the chuck and remove and change the drill bit size but on this particular knife we've got a 6.5mm hole for the thong tube and then a 4mm hole for our uh, loveless bolts to go through. Okay that's only two drill sizes but if we're making something like a Nomad we'll actually have six different drill sizes and we don't want to move that clamp so I'll literally have a different drill in each, each chuck of each drill and just work down the line and it makes makes making knives a lot more efficient then. Um, in this instance we're only going to use these two drills, well I might use three because I've got a two four, four mil drills set up, um, but we'll show you how we go about setting up this, uh, this first hole for our thong tube. Now obviously if you've clamped your blade on like this and you're just using it on a normal pillar drill, obviously that's not going to stay square and flat and true and that's where you're going to get a lot of trouble. So what I've sort of made is these very simple little support blocks. Now these are what we call one, two, three blocks. They're literally two inches by three inches long by one inch thick. They're used in engineering as a sort of precision sort of parallel to keep things apart and things like that. 
in this instance what we're using them as is just a set distance these are exactly the same size and exactly the same height from the bed of the pillar drill so we know that everything's going to stay parallel and true to this drill bit obviously make sure your table is 90 degrees as well but what you can see is when I lay my handle slabs on there there is sufficient room underneath that my clamp is clear of the table so the actual handle scales are hitting those one two three blocks and I know that that's going to hold it nice and square and nice and true and that's half your battle when you're making a full tang knife you want to make sure that all these holes are nice and straight and parallel and square and then everything will fit together nicely now obviously this technique will only work with uh, knives that haven't got a tapered tang and handle materials that are dead flat and parallel if you're doing tapered tangs or you're using things like jig bone or antler or natural handle materials that have got a non-flat surface you have to do it in a slightly different technique and we'll show you that another time now what I do is I make sure that my drill can pass through one of these holes in the one two three block and normally what I'd do is I'd run my extractor as well so all the dust would be sort of uh, removed from the drill and I won't be breathing it in but it'll be a bit noisy to do that so I'm just going to do it without the extractor on. Now I need to make sure that I hold this sufficiently firm and flat so that it's not going to move. Turn on my drill and then I'm going to very carefully line up that drill so it goes through the, the hole in the actual knife tang and once I'm happy that it's in the right place hold everything nice and firm and just very carefully drill all the way through. You might need to bring the dr drill up a little bit just to clear. And carefully when you get to the other side, just drill very carefully so it doesn't tear out the other side. And we should have a hole that's gone all the way through. Now if you've got a particular timber that's likely to break out, you can sometimes just put a little bit of masking tape on this back side so that when you drill through it prevents any tear out but this elm's pretty good it's pretty safe to just drill all the way through so that's our first hole done if you wanted to if you were thinking that this might move you could drop a little dummy pin in there to hold it in place but I'm quite happy that this clamp is sufficiently firm enough so we work down the line and we'll then work down to our next hole which is this four mil uh, diameter hole that's going to go through where that first loveless bolt is going to go. So line that up. And drill all the way through. And you'll probably see even at this stage, this is why I put the clamp in the very middle of the tang so that it's there's a lot of clearance between the clamp and the chuck of my drill. So that's the next hole done. So we'll work down the line. Obviously I could use that same drill and just move it, but I kind of prefer having everything set up ready to rock so I don't have to move the, the sort of one, two, three blocks too much. So line that up and we can drill all the way through. And that's pretty much those holes drilled now. now the important thing is we need to mark out the shape of the knife before we unclamp this so we'll go to the next bench and show you how to do that. So I've got this very high tech setup over here that allows me to lay my uh, handle block on there still keeping the, the clamp in place and just allows me to get a biro and just mark all the way around there. I mean some people use like a permanent marker but what I've found is if you use a marker, sometimes it, it bleeds into the material. So I prefer just to use a biro. If I'm working on synthetic handle materials, I'll tend to use um, a scribe and scratch it, scratch it round. But with wood, it doesn't show up very well. So just make sure you go all the way round. Then what we can do is we can unclamp it. Obviously, if you've got a specific blade and you're working on multiples, make sure you keep the blades and the handles together so you know which is which. Now we've got our profile drawn all the way around but the next thing we need to know is where the handle will finish. When I positioned this I allowed sufficient waste in front of where the handle will finish so that I can trim this off. Um, it's a real pain if your handle material is too short and you've, you haven't got it beyond where you actually want the handle to finish. So make sure you have a bit of surplus both sides. So this is where that handle blank that we were showing you earlier really helps because obviously that will actually show me 
where the handle scales will finish and I try and keep them all pretty much the same so that every one is a bit consistent. So if you haven't got a handle blank you could just mark where you want the handle to finish and then use a ruler or a curve to just draw that line over there. But what I find is if I, even if I've been drilling a blade like that I'll tend to use a handle blank just to line up like so and then I can just mark that front area of that handle then. So at this stage we've got our holes drilled but they still move around, they're two separate scales at this stage. So when we take them to the saw to cut them out, we want to make sure that we're cutting out them out so that they're a matching pair. So at this stage, this is where I use these little dummy pins. So these are actually loveless bolts, or certainly one half of them. And I can use these as a, a sort of adjustable pin. So I can slide that all the way through the handle materials. And then I can adjust that little loveless bolt so that I can make it so that no, no uh, sort of extra screw sticks out from beyond the other side. If you don't do that and there's a bit of pin sticking out, when you put it on the, the bandsaw to cut it, it will rock all over the place. So having, having these adjustable ones so that you can adjust them for different thicknesses of handle material is actually quite, quite useful. So that's gonna lock that in place. And just as an extra, I like to even add a little bit of um, same material that I use for the, the, the lanyard hole, but I've just squeezed the end in a vise to just create a little flared end so it gives me something to grip and it stops it going all the way through. So that's our two halves sort of back together again. So we'll take them to the saw and we'll cut them out. So come over to the band saw. This is the one that I've got set up for cutting wood. So it's just got a normal, in fact, this has actually got a, a normal carbon steel blade on there. I do actually tend to run um, metal cutting blades even on this wood cutting bandsaw, but that'll be fine for cutting this wood. Now I go for a quarter inch blade because it allows me to cut these curves a little bit easier. And obviously, because you've got all this hardware sticking out the top, you need to adjust your blade guides so that they're as close to the handle material as possible, but obviously so that your, your sort of uh, little pins aren't gonna catch. And then we're gonna carefully cut it. Now, I'm gonna turn the extractor on, it'll be a bit noisy. much cut all the way around the profile now we've got as close to that line as we dare but obviously we want to make sure that if anything we always aim on the outside of that that pen line um, the only bit that really matters to clean up at this stage is this front uh, the rest of it will obviously get cleaned up and shaped when we actually shape the knife handle when it's actually glued on but this bit is the bit that we need to concentrate on next. So we're gonna take it through to the grinding room and we're gonna actually put our final finish on this front of the handle scales before we go any further. So come through to the grinding room and this is my sort of setup for any sort of wood grinding really. So I've got a good extraction on this machine and I've got a 60 grit uh, zirconian belt running on this at the moment. And that will probably be coarse enough to remove any excess material. Don't run it too fast. I mean, this is where variable speed really comes into its own because certain hand materials will scorch if the belt's running too fast. So first thing I like to do is set this fence and I wanna make sure that that fence is actually pretty much square. And tighten that up. So having a little engineer square kicking around the workshop is always pretty handy. And I'm gonna grind this front profile to my line. That's the first task that I'm gonna do. So turn the grinder on. Turn the extractor on, and then we'll clean up that, that front. So that's gone right back to that pen line. It's entirely up to you. If you wanted to make it a little bit nicer to work with, you could actually use the grinder even at this stage just to clean up those, those edges. Just work a little bit closer to the line. 
I tend to do that because it's got to come off at some point. So you may as well do it now when there's no steel in there. Just makes it a little bit nicer to work with. So at that stage, we've cleaned up that front. If you wanted to, you could try it on your blade and make sure you were happy with the shape and the overall length of it. But because I'm following that same pattern, I'm pretty happy that that's gonna work. The next thing I wanna do is I wanna put an angled sort of front to the front of the scales. <clears throat> so rather than adjust this, this table, because I wanna keep that nice and square, I've just made myself this very simple little jig that just sits on there and that gives me a determined angle every time. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna now remove these pins and we're gonna actually work on each half of the handle scale. So put those to one side, you will need them later. And now this is the important factor. If you haven't got liners attached to your knife handle, it's very easy to grind the wrong side. Um, so I used to always just mark with a pencil outside and obviously inside. When you've got liners, it's really hard to to get, make that same mistake. So I'm gonna grind on this outside face. I'm gonna lay that dead flat onto my little angled slope that I've got here and I'm gonna grind away. And I'm not gonna grind all the way up to that liner. I'm gonna grind to the point where I'm just a few millimeters away from that edge really, but you'll see as I go. So turn the grinder on, extract the back on. And I start to remove that extra material. And I'm looking, at the moment I'm not, I'm not grinding parallel, so I want to adjust my pressure. And I've ground so that I'm probably about a millimetre away from where that liner starts. And that's probably pretty good. A good place to finish at this 60 grit stage, because you can see it leaves some pretty deep scratches in there. And we're going to do the same on the other side. Just like that. Now you might be wondering why we bother to put that sort of angled slope on the, the front of the knife scales. It basically allows you to, when it's actually on the finished knife, to sort of put your thumb over the edge. So if you're doing things like chest lever grips and things like that, it just makes the handle nicer to hold. Also put in that angled slope, it really helps when you actually put your knife in your sheath, whether it be a leather sheath, a kydex sheath, that angled slope just helps the knife handle go into the sheath nicely without it sort of hitting up on a square, square edge. Now, if you haven't got a grinder, you can do this manually by hand with files and some various grades of sandpaper, but obviously this does speed the whole operation up. So that was 60 grit. We're gonna go through some grades of paper now, so we're gonna change it over and I'm probably gonna go for a 120 grit next. And I'm gonna work through the grades right up to 400 grit on the grinder um, and get a really nice smooth finish. So carefully work back on those slopes again. So you can see from 60 to 120, it's already making a big difference. And this is what I love about the Radius Master so much. It's so quick to change the belts over. We'll go for 220 grit now. And at this stage, you might even find that you want to go slightly slower on the grinder. So turn the speed down. So we've got 120, 220. Look, you can start to see that it's getting really smooth now. And it's even starting to hit that liner material and clean that up as well. So we'll change the belt again. So 220, I think I would normally go from that to the 400. If you find that when you're working through these grits, you look at the handle scale and you still see scratches from the previous grit, they just go back 
a grit and go and make sure you get rid of them really. It's starting to really look good now. And it feels so much nicer on when you actually run your finger over it as well. So at that stage, normally what I do is actually put the handle scales back together again. Drop one of those pins in and make sure you drop at least the, the, one of those, either another screw or the lanyard hole. And you want to basically line them up. There is a tendency that when you're grinding, you might grind beyond and this might not actually be the same shape anymore. So what I'm very carefully going to do is just hit that on the flat part of the grinder and just take off and make sure that it all lays up nice and parallel again. There you go. So I'm, I'm happy now that that will match up on both sides of the blade. It looks really bad if you get a knife sometimes one scale finishes at a different angle to the other side of the, the knife blade so the handles aren't matched and it looks really bad so you want to make sure that that is really nice and crisp and symmetrical. So we're just going to do a little bit of hand sanding and a little bit of clean up on that and then it should be ready for the next stage. So we've got those fronts prepared on the grinder but it's a real nice thing just to finish it off a little bit by hand. Um, I've got various grits, but I'd probably go from straight from a 400 grit on the grinder to probably a 600 or an 800 grit paper. So this is actually this is actually 800 grit. That should be plenty, especially being stabilised wood. It tends to polish up really nicely. With them still connected as as one block of wood again, I'll just rub it on that flat. Basically, what I'm trying to do now is. The grinder will put the scratches, if any, in that direction, and I'm working across this way. And what that will do is it will actually show me if I've missed any of those grits and there's a deep scratch in there from like a previous grit, like a 60 grit or something. It will help me see if that's still there, because at that stage I want to make sure that I get those out. So you can see that that cleans that up nicely. So I'll do that side, and then this other side. Because we've done all that sort of preparation beforehand, this is a very sort of minimal stage really. Just like so, that's looking pretty good. And then I will just hit the front where those liners sort of protrude as well. Make sure that we polish any scratches out of there. Now these are uh, vulcanized fiber, but obviously you could be using G10, you could be using some other materials, some people even use brass and things like that but they tend to polish up quite nicely, the old uh, vulcanized fiber. So that's pretty good. And I mean, that would be sufficient just to go on your knife as it stands. But what I like to do next is just hit it on the buffer very, very gently, not too hard, not too, too, too much pressure because it will scorch it. And I'll charge this up. I've, I normally write on my, uh, my buffs what they're for. So this is for wood. I think that one's Kydex down that end. So. It helps if you use one one particular mop for a particular material. So we'll turn that on. Buffer, probably the most dangerous machine in the shop, really. So you have to be a bit careful how you use it. So when you turn it on, it's spinning towards me. And I want to make sure that I'm working beyond that center line. So obviously that's the center of the spindle. I need to be working lower. And obviously we've still got our bolts and things protruding. It's probably safer if you take those out. But we want to try and buff those as one 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 piece so just be aware when you've got those things protruding so we'll turn that on this is just some uh, very pale uh, wax buffing compound I don't tend to use any of the colored compounds on natural materials all it does is stick in the grain and look horrible so that's just a very sort of subtle wax really just to help prevent it from scorching and like I say very gently working beyond that center line and I'm going to buff one side. You can see already, look, just the, the difference. The one that's sanded and the one that's buffed. It just makes it really pop. And I think that's well worth it. So I'll do this side. And then I tend to hold it square on and just make sure that I catch those, those liners. And you can see that that makes 
such a difference. It's all these subtle little parts that add up to the whole the whole product really. Those little attentions to detail make a sort of heirloom quality product really. So, so far we've got our profile done and we've spent a lot of time making the fronts of our scales beautiful. But at this stage it's worth checking to make sure that it's all going to fit nicely on your knife blade. So we're going to use the actual bolts from our loveless bolts that we're going to use in this method of construction. And I'm going to slip those through those holes that I've already drilled and get our blade because we haven't actually fitted this handle either side of the knife blade itself yet. So it's a good opportunity to just check that it all goes together. So that's no problem. But now when we add the next component, which is obviously the thong tube, we want to make sure that that fits all together nicely as well. So that's feeling pretty good. Now it's laying nice and flat. It's also looking nice at the front end of the scale as well. If we needed to at this stage we could adjust this if it was either sloping backwards or if you'd made the classic error of making the handle too long and it actually projected over where your plunge line is you could obviously make it shorter. Um, obviously we haven't ground this blade yet so if we are grinding the bevel we need to make sure that we don't grind beyond where our handles finish so I normally put a little pen mark on there to indicate where I want it to finish. Um, it seems excessive to go to this point to sort of check that it all goes together but at this stage we could actually ream these holes slightly and make it all go together but at the next part of the process where we counterbore these holes once you've done that it's very difficult to adjust so it's worth just checking that it all goes together nicely before the next process really so I'm happy that that's all working nicely so we can remove those now if you were using mosaic pins or just pin stock they work pretty much like how our sort of thong tube works so you're pretty much good to go really um, because we're using loveless bolts loveless bolts are effectively a, what we call a sleeve sleeve nut so it needs to sit into a counterboard hole so that it pulls up against the little shelf and that actually affixes the handle very securely to the tang itself um, the thing that I like to do first before I do those counterbores is I like to add some extra little holes on the inside of the scale to add adhesion basically, add surface area and it helps the epoxy that we're going to use really sort of dig into the handle scales and obviously bond the handle scales to the blade. So I used to use different things for, for doing these counterbores. I actually found that using a, a countersink works really nicely especially if you've got um, handle liners uh, bonded onto your scales. If you're using things like fibre liner there the tendency to sort of tear out if you're just using a normal drill bit. So I've got this small counterbore set up and it should give me enough travel on the drill and I'm just going to put a tiny little maybe three mil divot in the inside of the scale obviously making sure that I go way beyond the edge of the handle scale. If you wanted to you could mark it out beforehand and it might seem excessive but I tend to run a little extractor on the, the pillar drill itself as well. So I'll turn that on. So I put two near the front hand, end of the handle. Like that. And then I put a couple back here. A few more there and then I'll flip it round. Put one there a couple there. So that just adds extra area for the glue to sink into and obviously help bond that handle on there. Now the advantage of using that counter bore is it doesn't tear any of the liner material. It just leaves a really nice neat smooth hole. Um, like I say if you use a normal twist bit it has a tendency to sort of tear a chunk out. So we'll do the other one. If you wanted to, you could set the depth stop on your pillar drill, so each one is the same depth, but I sort of just do it by eye. And as long as they're sufficiently in from the edge, you're not gonna sort of encounter any problems, really. Now, just in case there is a slight burr on that inside from, from doing those count, uh, those little, uh, little recesses for the epoxy, I like to just sand it on the inside a bit, just to tidy it up. 
and what I find works best is actually a sanding disc and I've stuck it to a piece of marble these are some sort of cheap uh, marble cutting boards from the uh, I, think, I think these were from a sort of like a cheap sort of supermarket I wouldn't advise cutting your vegetables on it because it wrecks your knife but it's perfect for having a dead flat surface and what I can carefully do is just lay my handle scale on there and just very gently do a few passes and it will take off any of those little high spots and get a really nice flat surface. It actually puts a slight texture to the, the liner as well, which will help the glue bond too as well. I wouldn't use a super duper coarse grade because what you'll find is you'll put really deep scratches on your liner and it'll actually look like a gap when you actually put your knife together. But that's smoothed that up nicely and they're still bonding as one unit basically, nice and flat. So, done the little recesses for the glue. I'm happy that it all fits together, so now we can think about those counter bores. So we'll go back to the pillar drill. We'll change the drill bit over. And I'll show you my counter bore. Now you can buy counter bores that will correspond with the fixings that you're using. I find that they're ne never really that, that sharp. So I make these out of a conventional twist drill and I've actually ground it with a grinder so that I've actually got like a sort of a lead spike basically that will be four mil that will match the diameter of our, our, our sort of loveless bolt and obviously will locate in those holes that we've already drilled and then we've got the outside diameter is the same size as the actual outside diameter of our loveless bolt sleeve nut so these are five sixteenths which basically equates to about eight mil. So this is an eight mil drill that I've ground and that will work perfectly for my, my loveless bolts. So what I wanna do is I wanna slide this into the chuck. And I know from experience that if I line up that, that sort of lead spike that I've created so that it almost hits the table of my, my uh, pillar drill table, that will give me the perfect amount of material left on the reverse side of the handle that you'll create a really nice solid shelf for that that's that loveless bolt to sit up against so I need to adjust this this table a little bit I know some people will just let it hit the table but it has a tendency to sort of want to kick over so I like to make sure that there's a little bit of a clearance just like so and if you wanted to you could you could lock your your table on your on your pillar drill to make sure it doesn't move but I know that that's going to be pretty much good to go so when you're using these it's very important that you allow that that lead sort of uh, pilot to follow the line that you've already drilled in there and then we're just going to hold it really nice and firm and then go all the way down with our counter bore so that it leaves that little shelf so we'll turn on the extractor Let it find its way, and then once it's found the centre, lock it, and then very carefully drill it all the way. So you can see, we've drilled that hole. It's not gone all the way through. We're left with a nice little shelf that that little sleeve nut's gonna sit up against. Now we could do all four, but I wanna show you how it fits together. So I normally got a little countersink on this drill. I just take off that hard edge, just like so, and then we'll find one of our loveless bolts, and you see that it goes in there nice. It's not a loose fit, it wants to be quite a tight positive fit, because we don't want any nasty gap when we glue up, but that's looking like it's going to work perfectly. So we'll drill the other few. So I've got the blade mounted in this vise. Now this is the vise that I use for, for glue up. So it's got some soft jaws on there. Um, and it's not a bad idea to place your blade in a vise when you're doing the, putting the handles on, whether it's glue up or a dry fit like this, because you need two hands when you're manipulating all the little different little components. So it seems crazy, but I like to do a little test fit to make sure everything's gonna fit together. 
So we'll mount that in the blade. I know that's not ground and it's not sharpened yet, but you could do it at this stage or when the actual blade's prepped. But I'd always advise doing this before you get any epoxy near it because I use a, an epoxy called G-Flex, which gives you quite a long working time. But if you're using something like a five minute epoxy, those five minutes disappear so quickly and you've got all these little components and you'll be you'll be stressing. So uh, have a dry run and it will really help you. So we're gonna start by putting one half of the, the knife together. So we're gonna put those little sleeve nuts in, in those counter pores that we've got. You don't have to push them all the way at this stage if you don't want to because the other half will actually pull them to fit. And then we get this half. So we've got our other half of our loveless bolt that slides in there and then we'll even get one of our thong tubes again and slide that in there as well and remember when you're doing this with epoxy everything's going to be icky and sticky and sliding around so getting used to this process is a really good idea so line that up now I use a little um, cordless screwdriver with a, uh, a, a bit in the end of it and that's going to help me drive the, the screws in a little bit quicker but make sure you set it to a fairly low torque setting because you don't want to just strip those those little sleeve bolts so start it off nice and gentle to start make sure you get both of them started before you drive one all the way home and be careful that this doesn't slip and scratch the front of your handle scale like I say, when it's all covered in glue, it, it has a tendency to do that. And you can start to see now it starts to pull those actual sort of sleeve nuts of the loveless bolts together. And there's that torque setting like I was talking about. Now the reason why the torque setting is important, twofold. One, we don't want it to strip our, our threads on our loveless bolts. But also, you don't want to squeeze these so tight that when you actually squeeze them, it squeezes all the epoxy out of the join. You actually want to leave some epoxy in there to create that waterproof seal. So make sure you don't squeeze it to death, basically. And that's pretty much it. Okay, it's not ground and sharpened yet, and we haven't got any epoxy on there, but you can start to see how it all starts to come together. And it's really nice to hold it up to some light and check you've got no gaps you've got any gaps here you can take it to pieces and maybe do a little bit of uh, preparation on the that sanding disc that we showed you earlier and just flatten the handle scales if you need to but that's looking like it's coming together nicely now the reason why I like using loveless bolts is that they're a mechanical fit so that's actually helping to hold that handle on there even without the epoxy and just so that you can sort of see how it works if I grab um, a loveless bolt you can start to see I've got this sort of cut through so that's got one of the sleeve nuts in there and what we've done is we've counterboard it like we did with that handle and you can see how you've got this little shelf that that sleeve nut sits up against and then when you tighten it it's going to squeeze it all together now when you grind the handle to shape this all gets cut off and you're just left with what I like actually it looks like a little decorative little bird's eye actually in the handle and it looks really nice so that's pretty much it that's ready for the blade to be ground and cleaned up so that's how we go about making the handles for our full tang knives obviously we haven't shown you how to do the epoxy in but we'll maybe do that in another video but hopefully that'll help all you avid knife makers out there if you've got any questions please feel free to just drop us a line and uh, yeah remember to subscribe to the channel because then you'll be notified when we release new videos on knife making or craft videos and things like that so thanks for watching and see you next time